Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, we're so excited to kick off our CMO panel today. We've got a great group of panelists with us. So to start, we've got Sarah Fluski. She's the Chief Marketing and Communications Officer at Nova Healthcare Administration. She's also an Acton customer. Next, we've got Abhishek Anjapa. Uh, he's the CMO of Touch Bistro and my former boss. We spent um, some time together at Revenate, so it's always uh, a good time when Abhishek's in the house. Next, we've got Elizabeth Haza. She's the CMO of Barnum Financial Group. She's also an Acton customer. And lastly, we have got Clark Newby, who's a strategic marketing consultant, uh, who's been working with us very closely, as you know. So welcome to all of our panelists. Let's see if we can get them up on the screen there. We're just waiting for um, a little bit of IT help here. One second, please. They're not showing on the screen. They need to speak. Okay, can y'all start speaking and then you'll appear on the screen? <laughs> I can ask a question. And then maybe <laughs> yeah. We'll that's... do that. So hi, everyone. I'm Galen Etlin, PR Manager for Acton Software here. And we're going to start off our panel and uh, see if you show up on our screen for the rest of our audience here. To start, could you tell us a little bit about your current roles and career background? Um, how did you get here? And Elizabeth, let's start with you. Sure. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, uh, like Casey said, I'm the chief marketing officer at Barnum Financial Group. We are a full service financial services firm headquartered in Connecticut. So that's where I am. I'm, I'm home today, but that's where our headquarters is, um, but serving the entire country. Um, I have been with this firm close to 19 years, but I spent um, the majority of those years as chief of staff to the CEO um, and moved into the CMO role probably about three years ago. Um, so in this role now, I am leading a cross-functional nine-person marketing team, um, overseeing everything from lead generation to client retention to social media, PR, internal comms, um, advisor services, and, and, and everything in between. And Acton is a, I, we are an, Act, I am, Mark Barnum is an Acton customer. We've been an Acton customer for, I want to say five years or so. And, and Acton is a big piece of, of our business, the work we do here. We appreciate that. Sarah, please tell us about yourself as well. Sure. I'm Sarah Flusky. I am the Mark, Chief Marketing and Communications Officer for Nova Healthcare Administrators. We're a TPA for self-funded medical plan benefits, and we are based in Buffalo, New York. So good morning to you. Good afternoon to Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. And um, similar to Elizabeth, we, you know, our team pretty much manages the same things, PR, marketing, lead generation, um, internal communications. It's, it's a big, big swath of the communications, um, client retention, client messaging. Um, and we moved from a, a um, we used Salesforce and started off with Parda and then transitioned to Acton. So we've been an Acton customer for several years, but also have experience leveraging a different platform through Nova. And I've been here um, just so, uh, going on 11 years in March. Um, and prior to that, every all my experience was in marketing, communications, event planning, um, fundraising. And if I tell you how long, you'll guess how old I am. So <laughs> thank you very much, Sarah. Apashek, how about you? Tell us a little, little bit about your role background and how you got here. Sure. Uh, thanks uh, for uh, getting me on the panel. And good morning, everybody. Uh, my, uh, I am currently a chief marketing officer at Touch Bistro. Uh, Touch Bistro is a, a restaurant management platform headquartered both in uh, Toronto and New York. So we serve uh, the Canadian market and the US market. Uh, before uh, touch, uh, and again, uh, not to repeat uh, myself, it's um, uh, from a marketing standpoint, all, all the way from lead gen to PR to communication uh, to uh, customer success, engagement, adoption, growth, the whole enchilada. Uh, uh, briefly about my background, before that I was at uh, Revenant. Uh, that's where I had uh, a brief uh, uh, time with uh, Casey. And uh, before that I was at Cochin Technologies where uh, we were fortunate to take the company public and we were involved in like eight to 10 acquisitions. Uh, before that I was at PayPal. 
so that's it's been like a 20 year journey <laughs> for me uh so it's it's uh, nice uh, uh looking forward to a good conversation <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. And Clark, finally, I know you're friends of the Acton crew already, but tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, you guys know me, a uh, repeat offender on the marketing and leadership <laughs> CMO front, uh, primarily B2B software companies, uh, primarily Silicon Valley types. Uh, for the last five years or so, been advising high growth companies like Acton uh, in the space, um, working with uh, management teams and, and marketing leadership like uh, like Casey and the gang. So it's good to see you guys again. For the other panelists, I was live. Uh, I was in Portland uh, the last two days, and so now I'm dialing in. So it's funny to see all of you from this side of the room. From the other side. Yeah, thanks, Clark. So let's just go ahead and get started. So this one's for you, Sarah. And as we talked about, feel free to interject if you have an opinion on a question, even if you're not asked. So Sarah, how has the role of the CMO changed in 2023? What are you doing different and how the CMO duties changed over the years? Oh. <laughs> Where do um, I to begin? Well, I, huh? I feel like to, to say everyone is doing more with less, you could probably have said in 2019 or 2015 or, um, but I think as, as technology becomes smarter and can help you do more, you can kind of use your people to do other things. So I think that tech stack helps us do things smarter. I think in 2023, mm -hmm. that's something that we'll continue to focus on is how does that technology make it more possible for us to do more things, not necessarily with less staff, but then to kind of <laughs> increase the other things that staff can be doing because we can either automate something or get more intelligence on something so that we know where to focus from a marketing perspective. Um, and then, you know, social media is like a blender of activity. So just trying to keep a pulse on where you should be and when, um, you know, absolutely something on our 2023 radar. Great, thanks, Sarah. Uh, anyone else have, have an opinion how things have changed? Yeah, for, for us, for me, things have changed where I am much more aligned, almost like salt and pepper, married to our like business intelligence or our CRM team. So we use Salesforce as our CRM um, and we both need each other to, to, to do our work, to be successful in our role. And maybe years ago, it was a nice to have, it was some nice information to have, but now I can't send a communication without making sure I'm getting the right data from the CRM to make sure I can be as specific uh, in my language as possible to the people, to the recipients, to who's gonna be on the other side of the screen reading that. So I'm finding myself highly dependent on our CRM team, which is wonderful but there are times where I have to put on my software engineer hat. I have to put on my, you know, my, um, you know, uh, learn the algorithms that I don't really love learning, learn how to build reports that I don't really love doing. Like I'm, I'm a creative messaging person. So I've noticed that that part of the business is kind of sneaking, sneaking into marketing, which is good because I'm seeing the effects in communication. If I can be really specific, laser specific with who I'm talking to, we always get a better result. All right. Can I hop on Elizabeth's comment real quick? I'm sorry, Abhishek. I yeah. just I want to throw out there that we don't have a CRM team and we are not integrated, not because we don't want to be, but I think Elizabeth's 100% right that that integration and the value of that integration is so important and has been kind of my rallying cry for the last several years over here because that falls to me <laughs> to manage the integration for, for a platform and the, the tech side of what you need to understand in order to make that integration successful um, becomes more of less of the marketing and more of the technology skill set that you have to sort of bring to the table to get that done yourself. So good point, Elizabeth. Yeah. Just to add to that, from my perspective, it's we have always had, at least in the organizations that I've worked, we have mostly had uh, integrations but it's more like how do you evolve them to the to, to take to take it to the next level because the technology is changing like crazy especially in the last two years due to the adoption the outcome of covid is almost everybody is adapting to uh, ad adapting and adopting to technology so now it comes to like where do you stop how much do you integrate 
where do you say the risk and reward? How do you balance it? Uh, because budgets are limited. And uh, especially entering 2023, there is economic uh, uncertainty also. So the budgets are like, you need to be mindful of budgets. So I think the challenge for us at Touch Bistro is where do you draw the line and how do you balance the risk and reward in how much of an integration do you do with the, with the CRM and the technology team? Because the lines are blurred. Like you can, you can argue that from a marketing technology stack, marketing also is as good as like IT or software engineering <laughs> team, uh, especially depending on the size of the firm. Uh, so it's more like, hey, how do you balance that? And how do you still adopt and evolve uh, with, with more like need to have and grow, the, grow with them rather than bringing on a lot of things that cannot be managed? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I've been at this long enough to remember when, you know, so marketing has sort of gone from, you know, it, it's the old adage from uh, like 50s and 60s ad campaigns. I know I'm wasting half of my money. I just don't know which half, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. uh, to, to then project, uh, then we all became really strong project managers, right? And we all had to have a team. Of, we had to have at least, you know, even if you got, you know, a team of five people, one of them better be uh, somebody that's uh, doing the Venn diagrams and doing the calendaring and, and running these things as programs. Um, looking at metrics, um, as the room knows, I'm a recovering mechanical engineer. So this was like great for me. Like I, you know, I, I chugged right along with everything getting very uh, measured, but now technology has just, it's, it's opened up at least two major dimensions. One is the channel, the communications channels that you have to be um, performant across. And, and the other is now emerging more and more AI uh, and particularly being applied to first party data. So, you know, I guess the, the one thing I would add to all the good comments is, you know, keeping the end in mind, which is this technology is to help us close the distance between ourselves and prospects or customers so that we're tuned into them, what they're worried about, what we can do for them, how we can explain to them what we can do for them. And uh, yeah, so now we all have to be uh, you know, social media artists and, and technologists and, and integration experts as well. But uh that's that's what keeps the that's what keeps it interesting. Yeah, managing all the integrations and that they're firing properly is truly a full time job these days. So go ahead. Well, Casey and I run a podcast that's all about marketers making rebellious moves, out of the box decisions. As a CMO, how do you really make those calculated risks, and and how do you come to your technology choices, as in the platforms you use and which tech trends that you jump on and embrace? So and Abhishek, let's start with you. Okay. Uh, so the way we do it at Touch Based on where I believe uh, for what has worked for us or for me in many companies is first understanding what is the objective. Uh, cut, cutting through the noise. Why are we doing what we need to do and what is required? What I've seen in my experience is generally we tend to latch on to many different uh, integrations or newer systems or cost-saving apparently cost-saving uh, strategies or platforms and do not take it through. Uh, sometimes it's better to take it, take, and most of these, at least uh, for by and large, serve the purpose. So it's like, hey, how do you optimize on what you identify? Uh, so I would say, uh, at, at least at uh, Touch Bistro, what we do is spend a lot of time in the initial phase of evaluation and make sure that that is something that works for us over a, not just for today, but over a period of at least two to three years. And then make sure we optimize and maximize that potential all the way. There's no point in like starting something and then leaving it midway and jumping on to another platform or uh, other things. Uh, so that is how uh, I have been able to maneuver uh, some of these challenges. Uh, but the reality is I would always go back to the basics as like, where can we simplify processes? And what is the outcome of that? Uh, if we can keep fo keep our focus on on like hey, doing what is required and needed, uh, then jumping onto any shiny object, uh, half of our uh, work is done. So that's sort of what uh, what we follow at uh, at Touch Are there any follow ups from all of you? Um, sure. We. We have a culture, I, I consider myself lucky as a marketer, 
because we have a, a culture of growth mindset at Barnum where we are pushed to try new things and to take these calculated risks, but do them relatively safely. Um, so I, and I am a pretty risk adverse person just by nature. I'm pretty cautious. I'm a planner. So that's a struggle for me. So I am kind of pushed by my CEO to take more of these risks and to do these things, but just get off of them quickly, right? Don't be silly. If we see something is not working for a few months or six months or nine months, get off of it and let's move on. Um, so I'm lucky that I get to go into it with that attitude of I'm going to try and I'm going to learn. And no matter if it's a failed project, which a lot of them are, a failed contract, a failed relationship, I always walk away learning something. I always walk away from the better for it. And as long as I keep that on the forefront, I'm usually in the um, And of course, size matters, you know, what the investment is, what the timetable is. Of course, that plays a role in how fast we implement. But a, a, lot, of, a lot of tech platforms now are pretty reasonable. A lot of them are still month to month. So you can kind of hop on a bandwagon for a little bit and see how it feels, see how it works for you. Um, I'm a relationship person. If the people on the other side, if the people sitting in the room like act on are willing to work with me or asking me questions or listening to what we need, then that relationship is just pulled on farther. But if I took the risk and I'm, and when I have an issue, I'm getting directed to, you know, a, a chat or a tech service number or a help desk number, that's, that's probably not really great. And that risk is probably not going to work well for us. Um, that's great. Thanks, Elizabeth. So Clark, let's start with you on this next one. We always talk about the need for sales and marketing alignment, right? We've been talking about that for years, but what should we really be doing to take that beyond a platitude into true action that has impact? I don't understand the question. Screw sales. <laughs> uh, come on. See, I knew nobody's now a couple of heads of Greg's head, at least one. All right. Come on, guys. Um, yeah, so first of all, yes, of course, this is almost it's almost been reduced to a platitude, but uh, but that doesn't mean you still have to eat your vegetables, right? It doesn't mean you still have to be thinking about these things and checking yourself on them and uh, doing the things like uh, having a shared set of metrics, having a single uh, version of the truth uh, that you're all looking at together regularly um, so that you can be uh, uh, aligning yourselves, sharing the effort, understanding the trade-offs. Uh, as we've talked about, the, things are so dynamic in the market right now, uh, going to get even more dynamic as we get into 2023. So we know that there are going to have to be shifts made. So part of it is setting a plan together and setting goals together and watching those goals together. But uh, as big a part is going to be when it's time to make an adjustment or make a shift, make sure that you are um, um, uh, do it, making those decisions together in concert. And so I think sort of the less dry and more... Uh, more critical and, and, and sort of soft skill side is that you need to demystify each other, right? Uh, a part of this is getting together more often and, and having shared things that you're looking at, but you know, you really can't, and I see this again and again in organizations, the ones that do really well, don't really see that much of a border between sales and marketing. They think of, you know, this is the revenue team kickoff, right? Think of themselves as one team. So I think you do need to demist, uh, I think you need to de-silo both information and planning together. Uh, and then a lot of it is the behavior that you model, particularly as a CMO uh, in that position where a, an organization, a team understands how, how they should be thinking about the priorities, the serving, the teaming with other organizations or other parts of your own organization from the stance, the attitude and how um, the, the leadership tone goes, right? So if you're kind of like uh, it, 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 uh, having trouble making hard decisions with sales leadership, there are gonna rally around uh, you and, and your vision. And if you are saying, um, Things are very difficult, uh, but one thing I do know is it's not going to be uh, it, it's not going to be an agreed sort of plan to go forward unless it's working for the whole revenue chain. They're going to know not to try to crop up with ideas 
or, or, or problems that aren't going to be going through that same filter. So I'd say, yeah, you know, you've got to measure the same, you, you got a single source of truth, shared goals, meeting together regularly, but a lot of it does come down to leadership and um, making sure you're aligned with what the organization is trying to do and how you and sales and the whole revenue chain are gonna uh, deliver on it. Great advice, Clark, thanks. Sarah, starting with you with this one, when you look at your MarTech stack, what causes the most friction for your team? And in an ideal world, what would you see? Oh, so I think Elizabeth's comment was really, um, she commented on the integration between your CRM tool and the marketing automation platform. And the, the key to that for us not being integrated is our biggest source of friction because it's so manual but because we don't have the tech support on our side to really make that integration in a way that we're going to say, okay, we've done this well enough that we can have like meaningful, we're, we know that we can rely a hundred percent on the report that we're going to pull to make sure that we're sending to the right audiences. If I do that, there's very little faith that that is a hundred percent successful. So a very manual process is kind of where we are. That said, the one thing that, made act on for us a very different um, option for marketing automation platform compared to where we were is it wasn't necessarily easier to use, but the way we were set up to use it with the training that act on included. And then for us through goose digital, being able to go back to them to say, you know, what is your best advice on how we can keep this stuff moving forward? I felt more supported through act on that we had a place to go, whether it was through an actual customer service representative, an account manager that would follow up with you on things versus that customer service phone number where, or an email and non-human contact where you're trying to get follow-up. There's a much better sense of support through act on. So even if the platform and the technology, and even if it's not harder or easier to use from one to the other if you have the support to get that stuff done you can continue in it successfully and the way that we've been able to sort of optimize how we've got lead gen journeys built in the platform and how easy they are to use and sort of the best practices that we got during the onboarding and upfront training on the platform made it so much easier for us to start successfully and then kind of repeat and build on that to where we're now at a point that we're, we can provide metrics and reporting out on ROI for things uh, in a way that we really couldn't with the other platform we had because it was just a complicated piece of technology with very little support to be successful in it. Thanks, Sarah. So Abhishek, this next one's going to also go to you. We had another non-Acton customer in the mix, but she had to back out this morning. Roshni's house was flooded. Unfortunately, she's in that Northern California area. So um, Abhishek, how is your team using um, your marketing automation platform? What kind of programs are your teams building in there? And if you wouldn't mind saying what, what platform are y'all on? So for us, uh, it's, it's an integration of uh, SFDC connected with sales loft connected with snowflake uh, connected with zara so there's there's a bunch of uh, uh, technology integrations and specifically uh, how uh, what we are doing with this is uh, going back to clark's comment what i want to mention here is the lines have blurred between marketing and sales and i would say sort of even customer support the gtm go to market teams it's the full revenue management teams. So marketing is expected to support both sales and customer success in two different journeys. One is acquisition. The other one is engagement and growth. So it's like the full uh, value chain or the full revenue journey of a customer that we are looking into. Uh, so from our standpoint, uh, at least at TouchB Strong, even at Revenet, it was like, hey, how do you integrate these things together and what sort of campaigns do you run? Say, for example, looking at the customer journey, you start off with like the prospects. Then you start off with how does that con get converted to a lead, lead to an opportunity, opportunity to a close, and this it doesn't end there. Then the, it's a transition from sales to customer support where you start looking at like, hey, what is the engagement level? What is the adoption level of the platform? How, do, how can we increase that? And then 
before the renewal is like, hey, how well set up uh, are we uh, from a customer standpoint for them to renew? So it's looking at the full customer revenue cycle and journey uh, rather than these pockets. So some of the campaigns that we run is uh, the prospecting. We do some uh, some campaigns, uh, obviously, social media, website, uh, and uh, ABM. Then you then you enter uh, the conversion funnel, where you also do continue to do some ABM, continue to do some uh, uh, mag mostly social media and paid media and email campaigns to prospects or potential prospects, and try to uh, sort of uh, uh, re-energize them. Uh, depending on which stage of, of the lead they are in. And, and then you actually position and then you get into the, the sales enablement cycle and campaigns for sales enablement uh, for us to close the deal. And once that, that is done, then you get on to the customer journey of like utilization, adoption, competitive analysis, sort of having some sort of a thought leadership and campaigns uh, across the board helps a lot in building the trust of the customer. Uh, and we don't consider customer to be only after the signing. We, in fact, consider prospects also to be potential customers. So that's where the shift in mindset starts and you start looking at it from a customer journey standpoint. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? That's, that's great, Abhishek. I th just that last comment, I, I just reminded me that uh, a couple of my, the different organizations that are in, we would talk about future customers rather than prospects, right? You know, so that mentality of like, well, what are we going to, where are we going to need to land with them and what direction are we going to be going with them when we start so that they're, uh, you know, that, that they, they come on well and have a good uh, long relationship with us. All right, Elizabeth, for you, this one, the amount of data available to marketing teams presents like you know, a huge opportunity as well as a significant challenge. How do you continue making decisions in this increasingly complex landscape, would you say? Oh, gosh, I feel like that kind of goes with um, question three about taking risks um, because there is, <laughs> there is so much out there um, and so much we don't know. Um, I... I don't know if I have a really great sexy answer for this. I feel like we just we just do the best we can with the data that we have. And it goes back to that calculated risk. Sometimes I have to just throw my hands up and say, we're going to give this a try. And, yeah. you know, kind of put aside when I'm doing budgeting, I put aside a few bucks of fun money. Like these, this is not earmarked for anything. This is earmarked for innovation. This is earmarked for trial and error. And I just try to kind of be smart, smart with that. Um, again, I'm lucky because the firm that I'm in, the environment I'm in thrives on that. They thrive on those risks. So um, when something works, it's really celebrated. And when something doesn't work, that's fine too. So I really don't, I really don't um, have to worry about too much. I'm also in financial services, which is regulated. So I also have a lot of people watching over me. So there's some stuff I can't do right off the bat, right off the bat. I can't take as many risks as we want to. So I am in, in that, that mid space. Um, That's really interesting. You don't, you don't expect, you know, a risk positive kind of environment in financials. Yep. Yep. I'm, it's very, very rare. And I know I'm so fortunate as a marketer. I don't have yeah, any, anything sure. looming over me, <gasps> making me feel nervous about what the outcome of a campaign or a project or a relationship is going to be. And, and that's a, that's a nice, that's a nice feeling. Again, as long as I'm smart. Right. And I don't repeat mistakes and I don't I don't get us into a really bad spot. Um, but going along with what Clark said, communication is key. Communication up to the CEO and the executive team, communication down to sales to say, hey, we're trying something new. I need your feedback immediately. You got to be a good part, a good partner here with me. And let's see if we can win together with shared metrics. Sounds I like a like great to, environment. Yeah, I would like to go ahead. Abishai. A little bit more also, because we are also in payments. We have, we are, I mean, our Touch Bistro is a payment platform. Uh, I would say, I would expand that not only your communication and putting uh, tight guidelines uh, internally, but it is also with the partners. Because for us in the payment world, you deal with many different partners. And uh, a data issue anywhere across the board 
can hurt all of us everybody in the sub in the chain uh, so it's 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 like how do i say while you take risk and this is very very specific to marketing because the data can be used in different ways and the data that you collect also can change if it is for transactional versus if it is for marketing purposes uh, and the lines are because they are blurred there is so much more regulation when it comes to financial uh, uh, identity information and all of those things so it's like trying to balance that uh, while i was not in the financial firm it was more like the pressure there was a lot of peer pressure also to say like hey we experimented this this is the new ai algorithm why don't you jump onto that like balancing that mm -hmm. but in the financial uh, uh, domain uh, the 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 noise is not as much but it's just balancing the risk because it's not just your company it's also whom you partner with so sure. it's understanding asking the right questions making sure you are you have the right uh, checks and balances especially from a security standpoint uh, on all of the data that is flowing across not just your company but also across the pipes yeah. with various other companies yeah that's a good point great point yeah, security and privacy think, are definitely at the, the top of the list of things we have to worry about and take care of as marketers. Oh, yeah, it's crazy. Uh, uh, with uh, shifting regulations around all this and then, of course, and then shifting capabilities for folks to get at that data and screw with it. I got, I got a text an hour ago from Kate Johnson, CEO, act on. Uh, from a Toledo telephone number, <laughs> asking me if I can immediately jump on you know, a call with her to do something. And I, te I, I slacked her. I'm like, are you actually texting me? But so it's, just, it's a, it's a freaking wild west caught myself. Um, uh, uh, but, and so, so one thing that this made me think about talk, uh, thinking about the risk question, the technology question, the data question is, um, I count on uh, my partner, my vendors, my partners, my agencies, right, to help me suss this stuff out too, uh, because they've seen uh, that they they've first of all they've seen they've got all these different customers where they're seeing more and more they they get more at bats and so they see how the technology works and doesn't they have their you know case studies that they can show me and oftentimes they have expertise in say a particular industry particular regulatory environment etc so i don't have to have all that on board in an environment where you know we're doing more and more with less we have to find trusted partners i think that can be you know our our tentacles out into all these shifting uh what uh, all, all these shifting uh, rules and regulations shifting uh, sources of data and how they're used, and uh, and I know that's something that that Act on you know strives hard to do is to to be a good partner to to our customers. But I think for a CMO having to do so much more, so much less in such a dynamic environment, uh, I, I think you'll see that that uh, order to uh, that kind of like you're a you're a vendor and I you know pay you this much a month and this is what you do for me to be more collaborative. Um, I found that to be uh, super productive if you can elevate those relationships. You know, what's it's interesting, definitely. I think about what, what Clark just mentioned about agency partners that we might work with. You know, we worked with an agency partner um, two now, and they both said, you know, if you cannot afford uh, a marketing automation platform, we can leverage ours and work your data and journeys through our platform. And looking at cost and risk and reward, it made more sense for us to want to own that marketing automation platform and really own the data so that we could make real-time adjustments. And I, I appreciate where an organization might not have the funds and they need to rely on an agency partner to get that work done. The value for us was in having that immediacy to those numbers and really kind of being able to add and subtract people the way that we needed to on our own time. So that's kind of how we prioritized our spend was not to outsource to an agency where it was an option, you know, a portion of our cost would go to them managing that platform. But really for that to be in our budget, it was a priority for us that that was a tool that we owned ourselves. And I think that's, I think we're seeing great value in that. Just to add one more point to this, uh, I think you know earlier you asked how the CMO role has changed. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of my time 
is now contract negotiation. And it's not about just, just agencies. It's getting into the legal aspects of it, especially when we're talking about payment terms. I'm like, holy crap, this is not something that I was <laughs> ready That for. makes me happy, Abhishek. I thought it was just me. I'm so happy. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, um, it's no, getting um, into the nitty gritty and, and making sure the contracts are well protected when it comes to data security or any data discrepancy that may occur. Uh, during the course of time and they're bound to occur it's not like yes. it's, it's not it's not a question of if it's a question just of when, when. Yeah. Uh, and we just have to be ready and the cost of those things are are like humongous uh, and especially from a startup or growth company they can really kill the company I mean I don't want to sound <laughs> negative but but that's the fact that's the reality of the that's the world that we live in so it's like hey how do you protect ourselves from that and that also has become sort of a CMO job. <laughs> for sure. For yeah. those in the room, definitely it's important to have empathy for the CMO these days because there's so many things that we never thought in our wildest dreams that we would need to be experts on, as you can tell. So I want to turn it over to the room for a minute to see if there's any questions that y'all have for the panel um, that you'd like to ask. Yeah. Hello. Go ahead, Tyler. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Tyler. Nice to meet you all. Um, Abhishek, you talked about how you have so many different pieces of tech within your stack and how they're all integrated to support both sides of marketing and sales, as well as data that you guys all look at to make decisions. And one of the things that I'm, I've constantly thought about, especially as um, our organization moves more up market, is from a CMO's perspective, how difficult is it if you have to make a replacement to one of those pieces in your tech stack, like marketing automation, right? We talk a lot about total cost of ownership and if the system has to stop for even a week, like what does that do? And from your perspective, like how difficult of a change is that given that even if it's not getting what you want or getting the results that you want, you're more apt to stay because you don't want to make a change. Very good question. Uh, very good question. And we are facing that problem today at Touch Bistro. And the reason why I say that is that is the risk and reward. The more you have integrations, the harder it is to shift from one platform to another. And to some degree, you were talking about how to integrate new uh, platforms, but I will give you an existential uh, issue that we have is like, hey, we are, we will, at some point of time, you'll start being held hostage by the vendors because they know how deep of an integration you are. And during this inflationary uh, cycle, uh, you, you're just going to like, oh my God, like the, the, the costs are like almost like it increased by 50%. And we don't have any leverage because the deeper you get into integrations, the harder it is to get out of it and the longer it is to transition. For example, we were thinking about SFDC and Snowflake integration uh, because the cost was too high for 2023. And we realized that for us to transition, it's going to take almost a 12 to 18 month period to kind of transition it completely. And, and not only is that, it also includes consulting, it includes all of that effort. Uh, so the, to answer your question, it, it's more like, how do you mitigate it and do it only when you have to do it? And then there is that risk and reward as to like, okay, what am I going to get benefit? If it is like a 5%, 10% cost savings, it may, it may not be worthwhile in shutting down the system or investing in a system that has to run parallelly for a, for a few months to make sure it's accurate and then you do the migration. So it's, it's, it's like balancing all of, those convers uh, all of those aspects and coming to a conclusion. But definitely, the, I don't think there's any silver bullet for that. It's more like it is a huge investment, both in time, effort, and budget for us to transition uh, and it cannot be, the larger the organization, it's harder to do it in a, in a short duration uh, because you have connected so much. Like that's the boon and the bane of uh, integration. You may have a very good stack, uh, which is awesome as long as it works, but when you have to make a change, it's going to become that much more expensive mm -hmm. for you to make the change across the board, time, effort, and money. <laughs> Taylor, I know you didn't ask me, but I'm going to jump in on, on Abhishek's comment because he has the integrations where we don't have them. But what I can tell you is what we do have within Acton is all these journeys built. So we've been taught to use this platform successfully. My 
my whole system of communication and measurement and it all lives very deeply in there. So even the ability to transition, just recognizing as a standalone platform that I've got all that to move means I probably need to have budget for two systems for a period of time so that I can continue to let my current journeys run while I'm getting all built up on a new system before you could cut the cord. You couldn't make a, you know, shut this down, start this up because you to keep running you need to have a period where you've got budget to let both of those systems run while you get your current, you know, journeys and landing pages and all of that stuff rebuilt and then get your new connections to your website for those landing pages. And, you know, there's a lot when you, when you dig deep and build deep into the platform itself, it makes it harder to move. So you'd have to have money to have both those things running simultaneously. And I can tell you it was easy to move to act on because we did not have enough training in the first one to have a lot of depth in there. So we were like, cut the cord and let's go. Mm -hmm. But, okay. you know, from the integration side and from the depth of utilization side, I feel like the heavier you get into both of those, the, the bigger the cost and lead time is to make that switch. One, one addition to that uh, is also what we are, what we discussed and what Sarah mentioned is uh, what we do internally. But if you're a public company, for us to change those benchmarks and measurements to the external world or to investors, that is going to take additional amount of time and education to understand. Because not every metric may remain the same when you move into the new new um, platform. So it's it's a, it's a lot of work. <laughs> well, thank you all. I appreciate it. Well, I do want to be respectful of your time. It looks like we're at the top of the hour now, but thank you all so much for jumping on with us today. It was so educational and interesting to see what's on um, your minds for 2023. Um, we wish y'all all the best. And thanks again. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Guys. Thank you for having us. Good luck to everyone. Bye. Have a great day. Thank you.